If you're in the mood for dark and scary with a touch of irony, there's nothing better than to sit back and watch your favorite stories on the big screen or even the little screen. Today, we're going to talk about Netflix's Fall of the House of Usher by Mike Flanagan. But how does it compare to the original stories it represents? What are the Easter eggs? Let's look at each episode by title and see how it shapes up to the story written by the master of macabre himself, Edgar Allan Poe. But we aren't here to talk about that. We are here to talk about... What? My son. Prospero. Perry. So Frederick told me before the end he thought Perry was your informant that he was giving you the information. Was he? Because it really doesn't matter now. Anyway, it doesn't, doesn't matter at all. Not since I killed him. Episode 2 is titled The Mask of the Red Death. In the show, Prospero, a.k.a. Perry, is the sixth child of Roderick Usher. Noticeably younger than his siblings, Perry has a different vision for where he wants the family investments to go. Rather than pharmaceuticals and healthcare, Perry wants to be in the exclusive club business. Keeping the invites at an astronomical cost, and by invite only, he wants to invite high-powered elites to an anonymous masquerade party, a euphemism for a drug-induced orgy without consequences. There are lots of Easter eggs in here related to Poe, starting with the Red Death Lady on the roof that catches Perry's eye, just a bit of foreshadowing for the impending life lessons about to drop. Her red outfit is reminding us of the Red Death figure in Poe's version of the story. More on that to come. Roderick's daughter Tamerlane is also the name of Poe's first published poem, and her husband Bill Wilson is a nod to Poe's short story William Wilson, about a man who sees a doppelganger of himself. Roderick's pharmaceutical company, Fortunato, is named after the rich and powerful character in the Cask of Amontillado who gets buried alive inside of a wall. Roderick's predecessor to the pharma giant, Rufus Griswold, is an old enemy of Poe. Upon Poe's death, Griswold wrote the obituary of a drunk and miserable man who no one loved and no one will miss. Describing a drug and alcohol addiction and a life of macabre, most of these descriptions were exaggerations or flat-out lies. Ironically, Griswold's attempt to smear Poe and ruin his reputation only propelled him into fame. To this day, many people think of Poe in light of these mischaracterizations. In an early meeting with Griswold, Roderick mentions Landor Pharma, a nod to Landor's Cottage, a story about solitude Poe wrote while living in the Bronx. Roderick's granddaughter Lenore is the name of the mysterious love in Poe's poem The Raven. It's also the title of another of Poe's poems. Other quick references are the ship in a bottle that Lenore and her father are building. Resonant to one of Poe's very first writings, MS found in a bottle. Roderick's wife, referred to as a child bride, is a term often used to describe Poe's wife Virginia, whom Poe married at the age of 13. Roderick's first wife, Annabelle Lee, is a nod to Poe's famous love poem. Not to mention all the times we hear the name Toby Dammit. Damn it, Toby, that's a good idea. Toby. Damn it. Cancel. Toby, damn it. Everybody knows that edible arrangements are what you send to people you hate. Damn it, Toby. Toby, damn it. Damn it is a character in Poe's comedic story, Never Bet the Devil Your Head. In Poe's version of The Mask of the Red Death, the Red Death is a disease that is tearing through the country. People get sick, and blood seeps from all of their orifices. It is very contagious, spreading very fast and killing anyone who crosses its path. In an effort to escape, the story's lead character, Prospero, holds a masquerade ball for all of his friends. All rich and elite, they are fortunate enough to live in Prospero's castle. While they engage in gluttony and debauch, the world around them perishes. Even Prospero's name is a derivative of prosperity, reflective of wealth and fortune. Much like the character in the show, he is apparently the descendant of a wealthy and powerful house. Epic. 
Dad doesn't believe me and the rest just make fun of me, but I blow the roof off this thing and I print seven figures out of thin air. Maybe I get a fraction of the respect that's supposed to come with this name. The entire show is told from the perspective of Roderick Usher. Many of Poe's stories use a technique referred to as an unreliable narrator. What that means is that the one telling the story can't be trusted. Roderick, the TV show Roderick, that is, has a condition called Cerebral Autosomal Dominant Arteriopathy with Subcortical Infarcts and Leukoencephalopathy. A vascular disease that can cause cognitive decline and even hallucinations. In other words, you can't be certain his accounts are accurate. Roderick tells his story to C. Auguste Dupin, the attorney general who has been investigating him for years. The name Dupin comes from Poe's story Murders in the Rue Morgue, the story Poe wrote that launched the detective genre. Later, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle would read it and develop his character Sherlock Holmes, based off the character traits of C. Auguste Dupin. Roderick tells Auguste that his son Prospero is crazy. The first thing you have to understand about my son is that he was, if nothing else, crazy. And in the flashbacks, we can see that neither Roderick nor his sister Madeline are supportive of Perry's idea. He wants to start a franchise of exclusive clubs for the super rich and powerful, and without the financial backing of both his father and his aunt, it would be nearly impossible to build the successful enterprise he wants to start. Perry believes he can make money out of thin air. When the siblings refuse any support for the project, Perry decides to do it anyway in an attempt to prove himself to his father. While in a meeting with his brother, he learns of an abandoned facility that his father's company owns. Set for condemnation, he believes he can set up his party and host an evening of anonymous and consequence-free decadence. The crescendo of the night will be the sprinklers turning on at midnight, bringing rain to the animalistic crowd that dances below the ceiling. In Poe's tale, the guests are hiding from death, the red death that is plaguing the country. The disease alludes to the Black Death from 1348 to 1349, which killed a third of the population in Europe. The guests of Prospero hide in his castle and hold the party of parties, shielding themselves from the horror that resides outside of the walls. An uninvited and mysterious guest shows up, dressed in robes and a skeleton mask, alluding to the personification of the plague. Prospero is offended by the guest and demands he reveal himself. Although the story is fictional, the events are rooted in fact. During the cholera epidemic in Paris in 1832, Paris would hold extravagant balls to celebrate what might be a short life. A letter written by N.P. Willis and printed in the New York Mirror in 1832 reads, At a mask ball at the Théâtre de Varete, at the celebration of the Mi Careme, or Half Lent, were some 2,000 people in fancy dresses and one man, immensely tall, dressed as a personification of the cholera itself, with skeleton armor, bloodshot eyes, and other horrible appurtenances of a walking pestilence. Poe almost certainly read these letters as they were well known in his day. I'm selling hedonism, privilege. It's a dark room with killer music, few rules, fewer consequences. Yeah, just, just let me come to the office, show you the numbers. Franchise projections are good. I'm thinking a tiered membership. Roderick, please, anytime. Oh, tiered membership. Why didn't you say so? No, we won't set up a meeting at the office. Being an usher is about changing the world. In the Netflix show, the guests aren't hiding from death as much as they are hiding from consequence. The selling point of the evening being a night of exclusive and anonymous raving, a night without consequence. Much like in Poe's original tale, an uninvited guest shows up, this time bringing consequence and death. Perry follows the mysterious guest through the halls and finally has a confrontation in the bedroom. I thought you'd never catch up. Well, you don't make it easy. Hmm. Nothing worth having is ever easy. In Poe's story, Prospero's encounter with death is far more brief. He chases the figure through the halls of the party, only to corner him at the end of what is known as the Black Room. Demanding the figure reveal himself, Prospero pulls the mask from his face, only to find nothing there. The mysterious figure disappears, and Prospero quickly begins to experience the symptoms of the Red Death. The plague spreads like wildfire through the party, killing everyone at the masquerade in horrible and miserable fashion. 
in their attempt to escape death with overabundance of life, death has found them in a poetic display of irony. The Netflix series has that same gratifying display of irony, as a slight to his older brother Frederick, whom he hates, Perry invites Frederick's wife, luring her into a forbidden night of pleasure and indulgence. Perry plans his perfect night. In it, he will enjoy a long night of gluttony and pleasure, making loads of money, luring his brother's wife into partaking, exacting revenge on the brother he hates, blackmailing the guests by recording their forbidden deeds, and most of all, gaining his father's favor after the night is a success. The consequences of the evening will be his to command. That is until the consequence of death demands payment for Perry's sins. Perry has a jaded relationship with his family. Completely unaware of his father, until he was 20 years old, he grew up a commoner, only to find out that he was royalty in one of the wealthiest and most corrupt families in the world. The Usher family, a metaphor for the pharma giant Sockler family, created a drug called Ligodone. Ligodone is a powerful opiate, sharing a storyline with the Sockler's creation of Oxycontin. Both Ligodone and its real-life counterpart were branded as non-addictive and played a part in the opioid epidemic while making billions for both the Ushers as well as their real-life counterparts. Ligodone is a play on words and is an extrapolation of Poe's short story Ligia. Legia is a tale of a man who loses his great love named Legia. He can't remember much about her, where they met, or how long they knew one another, but all he knows is that she is his, at least until she was murdered. The dreamlike qualities of the story and the lack of clarity draw a comparison to the drug-induced fog created by opiate addiction. It is the windfall of profits from this drug that gave Prospero the means to hold his great night of debauchery and indulgence. Tell me, and don't lie, is it everything you wanted it to be? Not yet. Almost. Nearly realized is the sweetest. It's better, I promise, in the moment just before than in the moment after. That is the truth of this world, but you did it, and it's everything you imagined. And there's still time. To what? To stop it. <laughs> things like this, all things in fact, have consequences. Just as in the original story, as Perry sees the mysterious woman dressed in red wearing a skull mask, he follows her through the blue room of the party and finally into the red tones of the bedroom she sits in. The guest gives Perry one last opportunity to forgo his sins and turn back. When he refuses, she disappears and instead gives warning to the working class who reside below the elite partygoers in the social hierarchy. The workers all depart, leaving only Perry's elite chosen. Those remaining are Perry's elect, their desires unfettered as the big moment approaches. At the stroke of midnight, the rain will fall. Perry had the sprinkler system rigged special. Lacking the water pressure from the plumbing system, there were big tanks on the roof. Perry had those tanks hooked up so the sprinklers could come on full blast when the switch is thrown. As midnight strikes, the signal is given and the sprinklers come on. As they wait for the water, they are burned by acid. In his haste, Perry never tested the tanks. It wasn't water, it was corrosive chemicals. All of the guests, including Perry, were burned alive and melted under the shower of acidic doom. The consequences of both Perry and his family have come to pass. Much like Poe's tale, death was inevitable. The Red Death has collected her debt. Well, that wraps up episode two, The Mask of the Red Death and puts in perspective many of the similarities and differences between the original story by Edgar Allan Poe and the Netflix rendition. What do you think? Which do you like better? Did you catch any Easter eggs we didn't talk about? Tune in when we break down and compare the next episode with the original text from Poe and point out more Easter eggs. Hint, there are many. Thanks for watching. <laughs>